I was to ask you which rocks are the most valuable to humans, or which rocks have been the most significant in our human journey, maybe you'll think of diamonds or emeralds, which are so treasured now. Or maybe you'll think of limestone, which is so crucial in making cement. Or on the more evolutionary side, maybe you'll think of flint or obsidian, quartzite or silkrete, which were used to make stone tools. But one rock that I think could or should get more recognition is ochre. This is ochre, or at least one example of what ochre is. It might not look like much, but ochre has featured prominently in our, in our evolutionary journey as humans and is still widely used around the world today. It is used across societies and across continents in many different ways. So what exactly is it? Uh, ochre is a, a term used for a range of iron-rich rocks or minerals that can be scraped or crushed to produce a colorful powder. It is often um, varieties of red, oranges, and yellows, but you also find purples and grays. It's a range of rock types from hematites to shales and mudstones and many more. Some of the varieties like this are really soft and the color can come off on your arm or on your skin simply by rubbing it. It's a nice red variety. But others are a lot harder, like the specularite. It's really heavy and actually magnetic as well. And it's, very, it's got a beautiful shimmer to it. And to get the powder, you have to grind it against a rock. Uh, but the powder itself is this beautiful red color that I, I kind of think of as, as nature's makeup. And it's got this beautiful uh, shimmery quality to it. So ochre comes into our human journey on both the science and the, and, and the art spectrum. The obvious application of ochre was and is as a pigment, a beautiful mineral pigment that's available across many landscapes um, in its many different forms. But it's unlikely, though, that ochre was only used for art in the ancient past. And it's this duality of the material that has complicated interpretations of its use. If I mention ochre use as, as body paint or as, as body paste, you might think of the, the Himba in Namibia or the Maasai in, in Kenya who cover their bodies, hair and clothing in a bright red ochre paste. This is ochre powder mixed with animal fat um, or oils and aromatic herbs. This is done for cosmetic purposes, but it's also done for ritual purposes and it has another interesting function. Ochre is an effective sunscreen, especially the red ochre paste, and it has excellent UV filtration qualities and good infrared reflectivity. It is actually thought to be a, a contributing factor to the low skin cancer rate amongst the Namibian Himba community. If ochre was used by past populations as, as they adapted to changing environments and had to move across sparse landscapes, it would have been a very useful substance to have. Also, it, it's, it's a, it helps keep insects away as mosquitoes, and this might have been a vital aspect as people moved in and through malaria areas. Interestingly, though, its use is not limited to us humans. There are cases of, of animals who intuitively use ochre. Elephants in Kenya or bearded vultures in Africa and Arabia bath in ochre-rich mud or paste, and they do this intuitively over generations. This may be done to signal dominance, but it might also be done because of the antibacterial properties of ochre. Ochre has both antifungal and antibacterial properties. This has led to the thinking that ochre was actually used to preserve or tan hides in the past. Um, it helps break, coll start co cause collagen breakdown, which stops the decay process, eliminates smells, and soften hides. And again, the red ochre is better at this than the yellow. But that's not all. Ochre also has medicinal properties. You can buy varieties of ochre, such as these reds, oranges, and yellows at markets around South Africa, and it is eaten by pregnant women who crave it. You can also eat it to help alleviate stomach cramps. In the, the Middle Ages in Europe, red ochre was put on bedclothes as protection against fever and rash, even miscarriage. So we know ochre has internal and external properties medicinally, but the specifics of this are not well researched and not well understood. So the contemporary uses of ochre include practical, artistic, and ritual uses, and it's likely that that's what it was used for in the past. Its color and the chemistry are both important in the debate, the art and the science. So most of the ochre that was collected in the past are these deep red ochres, like this one. 
And we know that most of the more useful ochres are the red varieties. Red is a strong, powerful color. To humans now and in this historic past, red often symbolizes passion, blood, birth, death, wedding, celebration, and these significant and strong emotions or happenings. How convincingly can we say that humans in the past used ochre in the same way for color symbolism when, when we're not sure their minds were the same as ours now? How do we know that they were collecting, if they were collecting these deep red pieces of ochre to use during ritual to symbolize blood, perhaps? We can't. But ochre offers us a way to get a glimpse into the behaviors and cognitive abilities of early modern humans. So we know lots of ochre was being collected and used in the deep past. Some sites have thousands of ochre pieces and lenses of bright red ochre powder. But we have, don't have much evidence of exactly how and why ochre was used in the ancient past. But what's intriguing is that ochre is, becomes regularly used around the same time that Homo sapiens become what we know as human. Evidence of complex behaviors is seen pretty convincingly around 80,000 years ago, but the evidence starts appearing 50,000 or even 80,000 years before then. This gradual punctuated development and evolution of our minds and abilities is seen archeologically through things like increasingly innovative and complex bone and stone tool technologies, that they knew how to hunt and trap animals, cook food, keep insects away, how to transform and change substances and predict and plan ahead, and how to use minerals in different ways. From as early as 500,000 years ago, we find rare instances of ochre being collected. By 300,000 years ago, a few more instances of, this, of ochre being collected and used in Africa, Asia, and Europe by other Homo species and Homo sapiens. We gradually find more and more evidence of our human ancestors collecting and use, using large amounts of ochre, scratching the surfaces or grinding the, the ochre to make beautiful, colorful powder. The earliest evidence of art in the world is made by engraving designs onto ochre pieces. And the earliest evidence of this comes from South Africa at 77,000 years ago. Even at 100,000 years ago in South Africa, we have some of the earliest evidence of ochre paste being made and stored in beautiful abalone shell containers. And even from 100,000 years ago in the world, we find burials that have ochre powder or ochre pieces in them. So also at this interesting moment in our human journey, we find ochre powder that was mixed with tree gum, heated and used as a glue, glue to attach tools onto to handles to make spears and knives. This might be done because ochre is actually, uh, makes, helps make a better glue, but things such as silica-rich sand you could simply pick up off the floor makes an even better glue. So why add ochre? Maybe it was for ritual to bless the hunt, perhaps. We don't know. But it's probable that these early modern humans understand, understood the transformations. They were getting pretty technologically, technologically savvy at this time, and they understood the effect of heat on glues and raw materials. They knew to heat silkrete to get a better quality, more raw material to make a better stone tool. And they likely also knew that if you heat yellow ochre to high, uh, high temperatures, you get red ochre, a kind of magical but useful transformation if red ochre is what was desired. More recently, ochre was a primary ingredient in rock art paint around the world. Sometimes it was, it was mixed with blood to make the paint more powerful, paintings that were imbued with spiritual meaning. Ochre is still used as an artistic pigment around the world. It's still used in funerary, wedding, healer training, and coming-of-age ceremonies. Part of my job as a curator and as an academic is to bring the past to life, to make it meaningful to us now. And um, I feel that in archaeological method as well, using the materials you're studying, experimenting with them, and understanding how they respond is so important to our interpretations. This has been a crucial element of ochre research that has helped us ochre nerds understand how and why ochre might have been used in the past. I have been fortunate to be able to share these, these humble rocks with, with many people during the ochre workshops that I run at Origin Center. Origin Center is a museum here in Johannesburg that explores the origins of humanity, the first people in Southern Africa, and the origins of our diverse cultures and diverse creativity and art forms. And I feel that by touching a piece of the past like this ochre, working it in the same way that people did thousands of years ago, it brings us closer to that past. 
okay and its products hold cultural meaning associated with the people who used it, people who were indigenous to lands or who were just passing through. I feel that these little iron-rich pieces of earth link us to each other, to our ancestors, to communities around the world, and to the original inhabitants of our continents. For me to see the way that people interact with ochre during the workshops, the art they produce, the memories they tell of uh, scratching pieces of ochre as a kid and making paint, or what they call ochre in their home language, and uh, what they use ochre for or people not wanting to get their hands dirty at first and in the end being covered in ochre paint, it reminds me how this finite resource is still linked with our human journey. Iron is the most abundant element in the Earth's mass and the most stable. It is dominant in our planets and our universe, just as it is the life force in our veins. So for science, for history, for art, for the Earth hippie and me, or just for beauty, I think ochre is awesome. We're continually learning about the human mind and its evolution. And these little iron-rich pieces of rock have a remarkable story to tell. Thank you.